Polycystic ovarian syndrome is emerging as one of the most common endocrine disorders which we encounter in our clinical practice and the disorder has been of late recognized in many situations where it was not even thought of earlier. That unfortunately has resulted in a shift of uh, under diagnosis of the condition to over diagnosis and we will see over the course of this discussion as to how often polycystic ovarian syndrome is either missed or messed with. So we'll start off with a couple of cases to see this actual utilization of diagnosis of PCOS in clinical practice. So this was a 14-year-old girl who presented with menstrual irregularity. She had menarche three years, just a year ago, and her LH and FSH levels were 10 and 4. She had visited because of irregular periods and mild hirsutism which was there, and that's why the gynecologist had got those tests done. An ultrasound was shown which was showing polycystic ovarian appearance and a diagnosis of PCOS was made and she was started on diene and electone. Now is this really PCOS? So we are talking about a peripubertal girl who has menstrual irregularity which is part of the normal anovulatory cycles at that age. This LHFSH ratio is not uncommon in this situation particularly if it is not a pooled sample. And polycystic ovarian appearance is extremely common in this subset. So therefore, clearly we have a situation in which we have overdiagnosed polycystic ovarian syndrome and unnecessarily subjected this individual to multiple medications. What about a similar situation? A 14-year-old girl presented with hirsutism, which was pretty rapid in progress, associated with hoarseness of voice. Again, an ultrasound was done which showed a similar polycystic ovarian appearance. She had a LH and FSH ratio not dissimilar to the previous case. And again, a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian disease was made. And the child was diagnosed uh, as PCOD and started on diene. To really agree, this is entirely different case as compared to the first case. Here we have a rapid onset of disease which is very fast progressive. There is hoarseness of voice, which means that there is something wrong which is going on. We are dealing with a disorder which is quite sinister, which is causing virilization. And when we look at the testosterone levels, they are extremely high, indicating a sinister pathology like adrenal carcinoma. So on one hand, we may have a physiological hyperandrogenism of puberty, which is mislabeled as PCOD. And on the other, we might actually be missing a very serious underlying disorder like ovarian or adrenal carcinoma with significant implication if you do not evaluate a girl presenting with features of hyperandrogenism in an appropriate and phased manner. So the next uh, few slides will be focusing about the what, why and how of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So the first issue is what really is PCOS? And in particular, the issue of what really is adolescent PCOS has been an issue of huge debate across the world. We all know that there are three components that are classically been associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome or disease. They are hyperandrogenism, anovulation, and an ovarian appearance on ultrasound is what is known as a polycystic ovarian appearance. Now, hyperandrogenism could classically be in a clinical form in the form of hirsutism, acne, alopecia, seboria. And these manifestations depend a large amount upon the ethnic prevalence of these conditions and would be different when you're looking at different uh, populations in that regard. We also have a laboratory marker of uh, testosterone. So we can measure a total testosterone levels or a free testosterone levels with total levels more than 60 being considered to be significantly indicative of a hyperandrogenic state. What we need to remember is that most often the levels of testosterone are not that high and partially this could be because of low levels of sex hormone binding globulin associated in this condition which we will discuss later on and therefore free testosterone may be of help. Having said that, we should always have a pinch of salt when we are assessing free testosterone because the assays have significant issues in terms of assessment and interpretation. The second major component of uh, what is classically been described as polycystic ovarian syndrome or disease has been 
an ovulation and an ovulation could usually present with oligomenorrhea which obviously has to be defined in terms of the menstrual maturation of an individual and we'll discuss about how post menstrual age is important when we are interpreting the number of periods and menorrhagia can also be a manifestation of an ovulation other subtle clinical clues of an ovulation would include lack of uh, a premenstrual pain and absence of breast engorgement because these are largely caused by progesterone so if you are having a an ovulatory cycle we will not have congestion of breast or a dysmenorrhea which will be there particularly in this regards polycystic ovarian appearance is again a very very debatable issue particularly with regards to adolescence where we need to understand that the numbers of cysts and the volume of ovaries are actually more or they are bigger as compared to adult individuals so we talk about increased volume and increased number of follicles or cysts but this has to be adolescent specific now having said that what is the most important aspect of pcod which we need to be very sure of when we are diagnosing that in adolescence and clearly in this regards hyperandrogenism is the most important unless there is a significant hyperandrogenism it would not be appropriate to label a girl with mild menstrual irregularity and polycystic ovarian appearance as in the case 1 that we discussed for long with pcod because that would have significant implications so therefore the conventional criteria have used both hyperandrogenism and an ovulation as far as the nih criteria to diagnose pcod but since we are able to really identify greater number of cases with a varied manifestations it was also identified that we can actually have a form of pcod in which there is just hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovarian appearance and one which we as pediatric and adolescent endocrinologists should be very wary of diagnosing is a combination of uh, pco appearance and an ovulation which is quite unlikely in the adolescent having said that whatever criteria we use as far as diagnosis of pcod is concerned we need to remember that all these should be revisited during adulthood otherwise we will have a significant proportion of individuals who do not have pcos or maybe had physiological hyperandrogenism of puberty were mislabeled for life with pcod and that a fact would be a crux to look into in this regards having discussed about the what the next issue it what is the cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome and this understanding is extremely important from a physiological point of view because it helps in clinical evaluation and also in terms of clinical management so we are all very clear that testosterone is the most important aspect when we are talking about hyperandrogenism which binds to the sex hormone binding globulin and the remaining part is the free form of testosterone which is acted upon by the 5 alpha reductase enzyme to form dihydrotestosterone and this dihydrotestosterone is responsible to have the cutaneous equivalence of hyperandrogenism in the form of acne seborrhea and hirsutism now a large chunk of testosterone in a girl comes from the ovary and a substantial chunk will also come from the adrenal glands and as you all know that ovaries are under the regulation of pituitary with the help of lh and fsh which in a two cell model act respectively on the theca cell and the granulosa cell to produce a uh, production as far as testosterone is concerned so if you have a high lh to fsh ratio lh will drive more testosterone production from theca cell and theoretically cause hyperandrogenism but we need to remember that this is usually a manifestation of any hyperandrogenic state in which the lh fsh ratio is altered so in most situation this alteration of lh fsh ratio is actually a secondary phenomena which accentuates further as far as uh, production of androgens are concerned increased amount of 
androgens both systemic as well as ovarian will result in an ovulation and a polycystic ovarian appearance now what we want to understand that is that the levels of testosterone have a direct effect on pituitary causing this high lh fsh ratio which further accentuates the whole process as well as a direct effect on ovaries causing an ovulation and which is in a way causing all these morphological features as far as ovaries are concerned so in this regards free testosterone level because of any cause will further increase the testosterone level and further worsen the overall clinical presentation and perspective as far as pcos is concerned moreover free testosterone also inhibits the production of shpg so therefore whatever total testosterone is there will now be available in a free form <clears throat> so if we by any way ensure that an individual has a high testosterone level there are mechanisms which will amplify it by changing the pituitary secretion of lh to fsh causing an ovulation as well as decreasing the amount of shpg having said that although we can have hyperandrogenism from the ovary and adrenals and we'll discuss about those causes the garden variety of pcos the one which we commonly encounter is not exactly a ovarian disease it is actually a systemic metabolic disease and pcos is just one manifestation of that condition and this situation is largely because out of all the fat that we have in our body a part of it is deposited in the cutaneous tissue and every individual is different as far as the capacity to store the fat in the cutaneous tissue the remaining spillover fat is actually deposited in the visceral system so after you have crossed your limit for storing fat you will have everything going to the liver to the pancreas to cause insulin resistance and this insulin resistance will then result in hyperinsulinism which has a direct as well as indirect effect through the insulin like growth factor 1 on ovarian morphology in terms of increasing ovarian follicles in size and androgen production and that is the crux as far as the androgen production in the setting of polycystic ovarian syndrome is there are a lot of controversies and this is a simplistic view but from a simplistic view if an individual is having more fat than what they can store it will go to the liver cause insulin resistance and trigger hyperandrogenism which as we have discussed is a self sustaining process will further amplify androgen production resulting in significant implications so now we also understand is that the pcos is actually just a manifestation of a systemic endocrine disease and all the other associations of insulin resistance like fatty liver dyslipidemia and type 2 diabetes would be present in different proportions in these individuals so it's good to understand that pcos is just the tip of the iceberg and when we see a girl with pcos we have to think of other associations like non alcoholic fatty liver disease dyslipidemia hypertension pre diabetes and obesity so we have to look at the whole metabolic syndrome before we start management of other aspects and it is not that that we should have a tubular vision of looking at just the ovaries androgens and clinical features of hyperandrogenism so now we know about the what and why the next issue which comes to us is how do we manage the individuals with pcos the biggest question is when to evaluate because now it's very common that every girl who is plump who has some menstrual irregularity or who has got few hairs will be labeled as pcos so if you evaluate every obese adolescent for pcos there would be a situation where we might be over diagnosing it so if we have a clear cut hirsutism equivalent and by that we mean that we should actually be doing a ferrimen galway score and finding if the levels are more than 8 which is considered to be significant then only we should actually proceed with evaluation is there significant menstrual irregularity in the form of primary amenorrhea anovulation or menorrhagia which go beyond the normal range for that particular pubertal chronological or menstrual age we should think of pcos 
if an individual is significantly obese, even focal hirsutism may sometimes be significant. So, what are the causes that we have to think of in hyperandrogenism? So, hyperandrogenism could be physiological and pathological. And it is important to make this distinction because a large proportion of girls who are actually being labeled as PCOS at the age of 13 to 17 when followed up over time do not turn out to be PCOS and which represents a physiological hyperandrogenism of puberty. So this is very important to distinguish between these two. Pathological cause could either be secondary or I've put as primary. Secondary causes could come from adrenal in the form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia or tumor. And we are here talking about mostly non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia who would not have any form of genital ambiguity, usually will not have clitoromegaly but may have mild clitoromegaly and present with mild hyperandrogenic features in this regards. Adrenal tumor on the other hand as we saw in the second case could be very very rapid and aggressive cause virilization and the features of virilization are change in voice, increased muscularity or clitoromegaly and that could be an immediate cause of concern in that regards. We can also have an ovarian situation of an ovarian tumor or hyperthicosis which again presents with a very rapid and an aggressive course of hyperandrogenism. And we also need to consider the possibility of endocrine causes like hyperprolactinemia, hypothyroidism and growth hormone excess in appropriate clinical settings when we are thinking of hyperandrogenism. So the key questions we need to understand is whether it is a normal process or a disease. We need to exclude the causes before diagnosing PCOS. And once we have diagnosed PCOS, we have to look at comorbidity. So this normal versus disease is the CRE aspect. So that's why if you have a girl who comes to you with obesity, with mild hyperandrogenism, please spend some time in actually assessing the extent of hyperandrogenism. So does she actually have hirsutism? And that's a big question because we need to distinguish hirsutism from hyperthicosis. Hirsutism is the growth of pigmented thick hair in the male pattern distribution while hypertrichosis is the growth of thin, less pigmented, vellus hairs in non-hormone dependent areas. The common hormone dependent areas are the upper lip, the lower lip, the cheek, the abdomen, thigh, back, buttocks and we have the Feriman galway score which actually scores the different areas from 0 to 4 and a score of more than 8 is considered to be suggestive of hyperandrogenism in this regards. Similarly, if we have primary amenorrhea which is more than 15 years of age or more than 3 years from the breast development, we need to be a bit concerned about the possibility of anovulation. While as far as the periods are concerned, we need to really consider the post-menarchal age of the individual when we are defining oligomenorrhea or anovulation. So in the first year, if somebody has four periods and the second post-menarchal year, somebody has six periods, that's considered to be normal. So please do not rush to the diagnosis of PCOS in that perspective. While the PCO appearance that we see can be in the form of often confused with the multicystic ovarian appearance that is observed commonly in uh, children and young girls during puberty in which you have a centrally arranged cyst while PCOS is classically a peripheral arrangement of cyst in a large number in that regards. And therefore we should not just rely on all the reports of radiologists which are mentioning uh, some seen as polycystic ovarian syndrome and look at adolescent specific criteria for this diagnosis. So now we'll go back to this case and we can clearly see that she at 14 years had menstrual irregularity, periods were there just for the last one year, had mildly elevated LH and FSH level, labeled as PCOS. So as we said, most of these girls do not have polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is physiological uh, hyperandrogenism of puberty, no further workup and labeling should be done in that regards. 
Now the next issue, once we know whether it's normal or disease, is to really exclude other causes. So when should we suspect? So we all know that any girl who comes to us with hyperandrogenism, polycystic ovarian syndrome is the elephant in that room. So when should we think of other possibilities? So of course if somebody has significant clitoromegaly, muscularity, change of voice, these are all indicators of virilization and an ultrasound abdomen should be done in this regards. If there is hypertension or stria, these are features of Cushing syndrome and further evaluation in the form of an overnight sex suppression test or a urinary free cortisol should be done. Somebody who has a lean and a early onset of uh, hyperandrogenism, particularly precocious pubarchy, a consideration for a non-classical CH and an assessment of 17 OHP should be done. TSH and prolactin should definitely be done in all individuals and IGF-1 should be done if it is suspected to have a growth hormone excess. So, we have a 14-year-old girl with hirsutism who presented with rapid progression and hoarse voice. This was clearly not a simple PCOS and this was a rapidly progressive condition in the form of adrenal carcinoma. So, if this 13-year-old girl who has classical features of Cushing syndrome and we all can see the round faces and uh, buffalo hump. So, there is a classical case of Cushing's disease. What about this 12 year old girl with hirsutism? She presented with premature pubarchy, was lean, there was also pigmentation. So, this is early onset of hirsutism, which is happening along with a lean individual with pigmentation. One should always consider the possibility of a congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So now we know that this individual actually has uh, hyperandrogenism and we have through other causes. What should we do next? We obviously should not stop there as PCOS could be just the tip of the iceberg and we have to do a comorbidity workup in the form of metabolic syndrome, do a glucose tolerance test, lipid profile and blood pressure. For fatty liver, SGPT and ultrasound abdomen and sleep apnea particularly because Obstructive sleep apnea is particularly common in these individuals and can cause worsening should be done. What about management? So we have already gone through the template as far as the causes are concerned. So we all know that the key aspect of management is actually the lifestyle measures of having regular meals, regular physical activity, cutting down on activity with the aim of reducing the weight by around 10% over the next six month period and that will really do the trick. That obviously is easier said than done. Some of the agents which may be helpful include metformin because they improve the insulin sensitivity. Then down the stream we can use antiandrogens like uh, finasteride or spironolactone to improve the cutaneous manifestation. And a combination of estrogen and progesterone uh, pills will also be helpful because they will actually have regular cycles, increase the SHPG level, reduce uh, the overall production of free testosterone. So just to summarize, PCOS is actually an endocrine disease and it's not just a local ovarian disease. Hyperendogenism is just the tip of the iceberg. We have to look at other possible causes and a comprehensive complication assessment is essential.